I want you to take whatever the worst problem in your life is right now. And I want you to put this in front of you. And I want you to see this the way Joseph sees it. Prison and slavery did not define me. Being falsely accused did not define me. God defines me. And His plan for my life is bigger than me. It's for all my people. There's a plan for your life that's bigger than you. It could be your family. It could be your school. It could be your business. It could be the people you influence online. What are you doing for God's kingdom in those people's lives? And to what extent are you being held back to walk in the fullness of it because you're stuck on wounds and hurts that you haven't attended to? It's time to get free. It's time to walk in the fullness that God has for us. Come on. Hello and welcome to the Love Key Church podcast, where we share our church's message of the week. My name is Heinz Winkler, and together with my wife, children, and our leadership team, we host Love Key Church here in Somerset West, online, and on this podcast. It is our mission to help you to encounter God, align with His purposes, reign in life, and help others to do the same. We trust that you will find this message empowering, encouraging, and inspiring. Please share it with your friends and family and write a review for us. And a huge thank you goes out to those who have already done so. May you be thoroughly blessed as you listen to this message. Quick recap, we are busy with our Impact series, which is a follow-up of our Foundation series. And we're looking at how are our biblical foundations that we've established supposed to impact our lives and certain aspects of our lives. We looked at how it impacts identity, purpose, and marriage. And we are continuing with how this impacts marriage, but the message today also has more broad applications to life in general. But uh, those of you who are married or engaged, I want you to listen to this message with that in mind. If you are not married, um, you know, we're trusting God for you, for a partner. But if you are not married, and this, does, this seems still like a foreign concept, these principles will also apply to you. Because we all need to deal with this. Okay, are we on the same page? Good. I just want to pray as we start. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this moment together where we can open up your word and speak together about what you are saying to us. And I pray right now that you will bless me, that you will touch my mouth, and that whatever is said and ministered here will be the truth and be from the throne room of God. I pray that we will all experience your presence and have an encounter with you that changes our lives. Lord, let none of us leave this place unchanged. We choose to make our hearts good soil to receive your word, the seed of your word, so it can grow in our lives. We pray that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you guys, when things were normal, <laughs> pre-lockdown, used to travel a lot? <laughs> Jackie, her hand was up first. And, and it, was that travel, if that travel was a lot of flying, can you put up your hand? Lots of flying, lots of flying on, online. Just put up a hand for us as well. Now, if you travel from here in South Africa and from South Africa and you travel often, you would know this line fairly well that comes up all the time on the intercom throughout the whole airport, right? Please do not leave any un, unattended luggage what? Please do not leave any pieces of luggage unattended. Any, uh, oh, no, forget I get. Like, I haven't flown in so long. I can't remember it myself. Okay, let's do this properly. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please do not leave any pieces of luggage unattended. Any unattended luggage will be removed by the South African police force. Unless there's a ticking sound coming from the bag. Just a joke. All right. <laughs> Why do they have this announcement, do you think? It's a rhetorical question, but thank you, my boy. I appreciate you. Leon, we should give you a mic so that you can answer all my questions. That, we should do that. Uh, <laughs> they, I think one of the reasons is that they probably think, 
or maybe they think this, that they don't want your stuff to get stolen. But I think the main reason is that it looks dodgy and suspicious. And sadly, yesterday, you know, we remembered 9-11, which was 20 years ago yesterday. And post 9-11, things changed dramatically. And this is why this kind of thing came in. So if your luggage is standing there and it's not attended to, it poses a threat to others. How many of you are light packers when you travel you know, you've just got a little bag, and it's for three days. Like, you are those, that person. Anyone like that? All right. Where are, where are all the heavy packers, the overpackers? Yes. My name is Heinz Winkler, and I'm an overpacker. Thank you, thank you. But I have very good reasons for it. <laughs> yeah, I pack like a girl, and then some. It's a... Uh, Always too much. And, too, and then when my wife overpacks as well, and then when we travel together, and it's like one day, people go, where are you going? <laughs> For one day. Like, well, you never know, you know. I may need this. I may need this. I mean, and you end up using like one of the things you brought. Anyway. So now also, let's move away from flying. How many of you have traveled by car throughout this country, long distances, Cape Town to Joburg, Kruger's, Kruger, uh, the Kruger National Park, Krugersdorp, all the Krugers, have you been to them? So some of, us, some of us have very nice cars, very fancy cars, very expensive cars, some of us don't. Um, but when you start your journey, what do you typically do? You typically start with a clean or clean-ish car, right? You put in some petrol or diesel, you make sure the tires are going to work, you make sure your spare tire is working. All those things, right? And some of us still put jumper cables in the car just for in case. <laughs> but whether your car cost 1.5 million rand or whether you bought it second hand for 100,000 rand, when you start your journey, oh, sorry, when you end your journey, what is it going to look like, whether it's fancy or not? Full of bugs. It's bug city on the front of your car, right? Because there are bugs everywhere on the road. When you travel far, they just get more and more and more and more and more. All right. Now, in a way, each of us is like a car that has traveled some distance. doesn't matter where we were born, what kind of class we were born in, what kind of race we are. We all have, by the time we've lived life a bit, we've been hit by some bugs. Would you agree? All right. Guys, we're still looking at how our foundation should impact our lives. And what, but the, the big thing is we can know the foundations. And I keep hopping on this because I still believe there's people that have only heard the truth, but they haven't applied the truth. And I want us all to get to that place where we take what the Word of God says and we actually start applying it by faith to our lives. But if we do that, we, we are getting to a place where we can walk in the fullness that God has for us. And last week we looked at what was God's original standard for marriage. How many of you were a little bit shaken by that message? I've got, I got quite a few responses this week. <laughs> but when we, when, we, when we are given that stark contrast between what the world says marriage is and what God actually said from the beginning it is, we go, whoa, okay, Maybe I've allowed some of this into my life. Now, now that we know what God's standard is, we need, to, we need to now say, okay, I still have a choice. I, now, I can know what God's standard is, but I can still choose to not follow His standard. Even if I'm born again, I call myself a Christian and all that stuff. If I don't actually say that is the standard I'm going to live by, by the grace and the power of God, things will stay the same. So we want to get to that place where we can do that. And one of the things that stand in the way of us doing that is the stuff stuck to the, to the front of our car, so to speak. So one of the main reasons, let me put it in another way, one of the main reasons we can feel this way, like I want to do the right thing, I want to live according to that standard, but I don't, is because we have unattended luggage. So the message today is called, leave your luggage attended. Did you see what I did there? Just give me an applause, please. It's good. Come on. I can't take the credit. I can't. 
this was God just showing me how this is actually so important. Because at the, at the airport, they tell us to not leave our luggage unattended. But God wants to tell us today, leave your luggage attended. When we, re- donkey baby. when we repent and get saved and we give our lives to Jesus, we become new creations in Christ. If you agree, say amen. amen. The old has gone and the new has come. That's what the word says. Our old self with all its baggage is dead. So why does my baggage still trouble me? Does anyone have that question? Have you struggled with that question? I struggled with that question for a long time in my life. Why does it still hold me back? Why do I, like Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do. It has not been dealt with. It's because we haven't attended to it. It has not been identified and brought to God so he can heal us. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he said, tetelestai, he meant it. It is done. He died for all sin and he set us free from slavery to sin and the consequences thereof. Do you guys believe that? Romans 12 teaches us to not make, uh, sorry, Romans 12 is one of the places where Paul said that thing I said earlier, brethren, I beseech you therefore, make yourselves a living sacrifice. Have you thought about that, what that means? What does that mean? If you sacrifice something, what does it do? It dies, right? So how is it, what's a living sacrifice? It is, I mean, it's, it's a, I don't want to put a weird image in your mind, but imagine an animal that's there, it's alive, but it's, it's being sacrificed. It looks horrible, right? That's not what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to go, ah! So what would it be? It would be a life where I have chosen to make myself a sacrifice, and I'm living life with God, doing things His way. But I'm, I've laid down my will. I've laid down what I want to do, how I think, all the stuff from my old self. He's just instructing us to do what happened when we gave our lives to Jesus. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. See, you know the scripture because you've been over-evangelized, most of you. But do we apply it? Are we actually going every day, how can I renew my thinking? Or what, what of my thinking is not in line with God's original plan? What if my thinking is not in line with God's word? What am I saying about myself the whole time? Oh, arme ek, ek is a victim. Alles gebeur met my. Everything's going wrong in my life. Poor me, poor this, blah, blah. Have you read Ephesians 1? Have you read Psalm 139? Have you read 1 Peter 2? All these scriptures tell us who we are in Christ. So when I'm stuck in a victim mentality, it means I'm not in line with his word. So there's a reason I'm stuck. in. And if I ask you, are you a Christian? And you say yes, and you're stuck in that victim mentality, then you, it's not the word of God that's wrong. It's something in your life that hasn't been identified and attended to. Does that make sense? All right. Remember our church's values. Encounter God, align with His purposes, reign in life, help others to do the same. An encounter with God, in, when it's the first time, leads to salvation, which is our second um, foundation we talked about, which brings us into a relationship with Jesus and gains us access to the Father. We saw that in the two sessions we did about the heart of the Father. Jesus is the way to the Father, the only way. Other people hate it when we say that, but that is the truth. And now, and we are now led by the Holy Spirit. So when we get saved, we get access to the Father, and we are led by the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is in our lives. The, the Bible says our bodies become temples of, of the Holy Spirit. Sure. A couple of weeks ago, I did a message on Ezekiel 8. And God showed us the idols in our lives, and we had to go look at our temples and see what idols is stuck in our temples. It is no, when I'm saved, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who? See, you know it, but do you do it? Do we live that way? Do we live that way? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The Bible also says, I have the mind of Christ. 
when I'm in Him. The mind of Christ. So I should think like Christ. I then have on, now as a Christian, I have ongoing encounters with God. And as I spend time in His Word and time worshiping Him, and during each encounter, I learn how to more align myself with His will. And for His kingdom and for me in His kingdom. As I align more and more, I become more and more healed from my past hurts, from my baggage. And I become more like Jesus every day. The closer I become, uh, the closer I come to Jesus, the more I see my true identity. The more I see Him, the more I see myself and who I really am in Him. Amen? And I realize my worth in Him. And it becomes easier to identify the wounds from the past and how the enemy has used them to lie to me. You see, that is the biggest problem with wounds. It gives an opening to the enemy to lie to us about who we really are. Why have I been preaching about fatherlessness and the father heart of God? Because the biggest crisis in our world is fatherlessness. If you did not have a father growing up, or if you had a bad father, we spoke about this a few times, the devil will use that to say to you, you're not worth God's time. Look at, look at what he did. They abandoned you. If they abandoned you, why would God, you know, give you, spare you any, any time? And that is a lie from the enemy, trying to derail you from your true identity. I've shared this with you as well, that our values that I just said come from, in, in, in part, from a summary of what a life-giving church should be that I heard the one time. And a life-giving church should get lost people saved, evangelism, get saved people healed, which is pastoral, but also there's prophetic involved, get healed people to discover their callings in the kingdom, that's apostolic, and then send them out into those callings. So we see the fivefold ministry operating in these four things. And all four of these people should feel welcome on a Sunday. So, are you saved? Are you healed or in the process of getting healed? Anyway, all right. Have you discovered your God-given purpose in life? Do you know why you are here? Anyone? Not everyone. That's fine. Thank you for being honest. Are you living out that purpose? If you said no to the previous one, you can't, be, you can't say yes now, because that won't make sense. <laughs> but we are all somewhere on the spectrum. We are either unsaved, or we are saved and busy with the process of sanctification, busy with the process with changing the way we think. Not because we used to be conformed to the world. Outside of Jesus, we used to be conformed to the world. The question is, how much of that old self am I dragging along into my relationship with God? Many of us are still dealing with the wounds from the past and trying to get healed. And that's okay. I want to tell you today, it's okay. If no one has ever told you that it's okay to have baggage and issues, I want to tell you, it's okay. What's not okay is to ignore it or to let it define you for the rest of your life. But we all have it. The question is, what are you going to do about it? You see, the rest of your life is not determined by your wounds. It's determined by how you choose to react to them. Remember how we established last week that God's idea of marriage, marriage maths, God's idea of marriage maths is not half plus half equals one. It is one whole person in him plus one whole person in him forms a new whole, a one flesh. Salvation leads, to us, leads us to being one with God. That God-shaped hole that we are all born with in our hearts is now filled with God. And we no longer need to find a human to try and see if they will fit into that hole. Because the hole is filled with Jesus. But as with Adam, God said it's not good for man to be alone. So he created marriage for a man and a woman. It is a good thing in God's sight that we get married. But we need to know that we don't need marriage to be whole. We need God to be whole and to step into marriage then as a person that knows him so that we can be the best spouse we can be. Are you with me? All right. How many of you know that when you get saved, all your issues and baggage from the past doesn't just disappear overnight in one moment? And it's not because it hasn't happened in the spirit, because it has. 
When you give your life to Christ, you are saved, born again, on your way to heaven. Amen? And Jesus did the finished work on the cross. But, and I've heard testimonies of people who give their lives to Christ and they immediately get healed from addiction or immediately know that relationship is bad, I need to step away. That does happen. And it's great when it happens. But for many things, it's a process to recognize the wound and deal with it. Because this is what happens when we get saved. In the, in the Greek way of thinking, we, could, we can see that we are spirit, soul, and body. All right? Now, when we read Jeremiah 1, which my friend Ade preached so well on, he said, God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you. In Genesis 1, we read last week that God created man and woman, male and female, in his image. He created them. What is God? God is spirit. In Genesis 2, God said he formed the man from the dust and then breathed life into him. Now, we are spirit. We are soul, we are body. When we get born, the Bible says we are born into the brokenness of this world. In Afrikaans we say, in sonde ontvang en gebore. And when you have children, you know this. Children do not come out without sin, without issues. They come <laughs> challenging us. And we need to discipline the hell out of them. <laughs> now, but that's because our soul and our body is born into this fallen world. Sin from Adam and Eve caused the fall of man. Now we are born into that. But the spirit that God has put into this body and soul, before time began, before the foundations of the earth, he knew. And he had a plan for that spirit. So when you get saved, what do you think is happening? Your spirit comes alive. Your spirit is jump-started into its original design. And that spirit is going to heaven. Amen? But now you are stuck in this body, which has been, depending on how old you are, you started in Cape Town. Some of you are only at Beaufort West. Some of you are in Bloomin. Some of you are going into Zimbabwe. The longer you've traveled, the, the more bugs you may have picked up along the way, is my point. So your body and your soul is like, you know, it's got all these bugs. And your spirit is whole. Your spirit is one with God. But it's now in this body and soul that needs to play catch up with where the spirit is. Do you agree? All right. This is a huge revelation, guys. I was never taught this when I was growing up, and I wish I knew this. This is powerful. This changes everything in the way we see things. Because when we know this, we can live free. This is the key to unlocking seeing what baggage we are still maybe stuck with, what bugs are still stuck to the dash. All right? Let me get back to my notes because I was preaching off script now. <laughs> Who of you wants to have a great marriage? Healthy marriage? That was very slow. <laughs> Let me think about it. Hmm. What's there to think about? I'm going to try that again. I tested you now. So you're ready for this next I'm going to. I didn't say anything. How many of you want to have... <laughs> for those online, the hands went up before I finished my sentence. <laughs> okay. Who of you who said, yes, I want to have a great marriage, is willing to do what it takes to have a great marriage? See, those hands went up extra slow. For those of you who put up your hands, great, well done. Die. Die. Too harsh? You should have died already when you gave your life to Christ. So why do you struggle to do it in your marriage? You are either not really saved or 
You are saved, but you haven't identified the wounds that you are carrying. And you've walked into your marriage, dragging this luggage with you. Either trying to ignore that it's there, or you haven't attended to it, and you are gladly having it stuck somewhere and pulling it along. (laughs) Coming with you. I don't know why I made that sound. It's a weird sound. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds better. Alana's going to go, (laughs) Farky. But if we don't take this seriously, that is exactly what happens. Now, what what happens in a marriage where two people bring luggage from another time in their lives and both think that the other one is saved and has dealt with their luggage? What happens? You have a luggage fight. You get slapped with, you know, unreasonableness and anger and irritation. And you're like, where is this coming from? Well, it's this bag that I'm still carrying with me from when I was five. Can you see it? This is going to set some of you free if you listen and do it. This is why we are talking about attending to the luggage. We need to leave it, but we can't just ignore it. We can't leave it in the corner for someone else to deal with it because it is a ticking bomb, <laughs> like in the airport. Is it, is it only to have a good marriage? No, it's ultimately to fulfill God's plan for, the, for, for all of us. This is not just about marriage, but it has a huge implication for marriage and every other aspect of your life. We need to all be in that place where we say, not my will be done, but your will be done. We have to do the will of the Father. All right. I have very little time to do the rest I want to do, so I'm going to try to get there. Because I felt God, that was just the introduction of my sermon. I felt God show me that we need to look at the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. On how someone who has a calling on their life has been slapped around by life, circumstances, people. He has so many wounds, he forgot how to count them all. And still stuck it out with God and came out on top for God's kingdom. It's amazing. I want to tell you, just on a side note, if you think you know a Bible story about a famous Bible character, think again. You think you do because you remember it from Sunday school and whatever. But please, do yourself a favor. Think of a Bible character, any Bible character, and go read the whole thing from start to finish. It will blow your mind. There's so much more in the Word of God than we get to here. It's watered down stuff we get. The movies have it wrong. The children Bible has it wrong. There's so much more in here. It's powerful. I had to really discipline myself to only stick to the focus of today, which is dealing with the baggage in a godly way. (laughs) Because there's so much more. We're probably going to come back to Joseph's story for other points. Anyway, so are you ready to read a lot of Bible? Who's ready? I'm probably going to skip some of this just to get to my main point at the end, but let's see how far we go. So the beginning of his story is in Genesis 37. Just a heads up. Joseph's story spans from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. The very last chapter of of Genesis before it gets into Exodus. (laughs) So, yeah, here we go. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Something interesting to note is they keep switching between Jacob and Israel. But it's the same person. Just remember that. At one point, this becomes quite significant. Israel loved Joseph more than his other children. Does that sound functional or dysfunctional to you? Because he was the son of his old age. So there's a great spiritual reason. No one got that. Okay. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. How many of you guys way back when saw Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coats? Some of you. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. This is the 12 tribes of God's people, guys. They were jealous. They were hateful. They were angry. They wanted to commit murder. (laughs) 
Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him, the father who loves him the most, and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and to bow down to, to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now we're going to skip to the part where he gets betrayed and sold as a slave. Genesis 37 from verse 23. And then we're going to skip to 36 in the same passage. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers. Now they were out tending to the sheep and his father sent Joseph out to see how they're doing. So Joseph is out there to basically click on them. <laughs> so the tunic of his many colors was with him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. Now, in the previous piece, it, it explains how they saw him coming and already started planning how to kill him. Now they threw him in the pit. Um, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Now, some of the translations actually talk about this as being a cistern. A cistern was where they kept water, and the cisterns are massive. They're really big. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh. Um, so I'm going to just skip down. Then the media traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. His life to them was worth 20 shekels of silver. And then they took Joseph to Egypt. There was one brother who stood up for him, Reuben. This is my boy Reuben's favorite part in the Bible, because Reuben was standing up for Joseph. Okay, there's a phrase we hear a few times, and it's a phrase that I want you to know is applicable to all of us today. The Lord was with Joseph. I want you to put your name in there and to know that the Lord was with you every day. We're going to look at how he, and because of that, he caused prosperity, and because of that, he got authority. Because God was with him, there was prosperity, and there was authority. Genesis 39, 2 to 6, the Lord was, sorry. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of the master, the Egyptian. Now listen, he's a slave. He was sold. He is in a house of a slave master, effectively. The, the captain of the guard of Pharaoh. This guy is high up. And his master saw, listen to this, an Egyptian who's actually supposed to be worshiping the Pharaoh himself, because in their culture, the Pharaoh is God. The master saw that the Lord, capital L, was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he, put, the, all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He completely relinquished his authority and responsibility to this man because he trusted him. Now, we read a few times that the Egyptians despised Hebrews. They despised them, hated them. He's got this guy in his house. He sees, he's a, he doesn't know God, but he sees God is in his life. And because of that, he's giving him all this authority. We're going to pick it up in verse 17 where we see he's tempted. He resisted it. He stays pure. Then he's falsely accused and he's imprisoned. Then, he, then she spoke to him. This is now part of his wife with words like these saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us. Now, she's, part of his wife is talking to part of her. Already what has done is she tried to seduce him. He, he, he resisted, resisted, resisted. One day she grabbed him by his cloak and he ran away and she held his cloak and then she accused him of attacking her. He's mocking us, so it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard these words which his wife spoke to him saying, your servant does, 
uh, did to me after this manner, and his an- th- that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. <laughs> Just to make sure you know, he was there in prison. Once again, we read this, the Lord was with him. Genesis 39, 21 to 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. He's a Hebrew. He's a prisoner. He's a slave. He gets to be in charge of all the prisoners. Do you think he wants to be in prison? Do you think he wants to be a slave? Do you think he's hurt by the fact that his brothers betrayed him and sold him? Do you think he's carrying some baggage? All right? Now, this is how he's reacting to his baggage. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. How many of, how many of the, the people that run businesses here would like to have someone like this? I don't have to look into anything they're doing. I can just trust them. Anyone? Any employers? Okay. Now he gets the opportunity to interpret two dreams in prison. And he asks the cupbearer to remember him. And the cupbearer doesn't remember him for two years. Until Pharaoh one night had a dream, no one could interpret. The cupbearer suddenly remembered him two years later. The testimony of the cupbearer of what Joseph did two years ago combined with what Pharaoh needed in that moment. Gave Joseph an opportunity. He came, he gave God all the credit and all the glory, and he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. Plus, he also offered a proposal of how he should handle what would come. He's an entrepreneur, and he saw a gap. Can you imagine standing there before Pharaoh? You are still stinking of the prison, you're still struggling with your slave identity. Standing suddenly before Pharaoh. Now, think for a moment. If two years ago, the cupbearer told Pharaoh about this guy who interpreted a dream, do you think Pharaoh would have let him go? And if he had let him go when he wanted to be let go, do you think he would have stepped into this opportunity? Two years, people, in a hole. He waited. And then God orchestrated this to come together. Pharaoh had a dream. The cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph. He puts the two things together, and Joseph gets an opportunity. Yo, uh, it's exciting. Genesis 41. The Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and a god himself in his context. Listen to this. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, the plan that Joseph pitched. He thought was a good plan. And in the eyes of Pharaoh's servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, now listen to this, guys. You have to get how significant this is. Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom the Spirit of God is. Imagine you are a God. People bow down to you. Whatever you say goes. You see something on a Hebrew person that you hate according to your culture. And it's so powerful that you recognize it and you say this to everyone around you. Yo. Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Authority, prosperity. Listen to this. It goes even further. In Genesis 41, 42 to 46, uh, Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. That's a huge, huge move. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride on the second chariot which he had. And he cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, uh, some word, and he gave him a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potipara, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when this all happened. He was in a prison. 
Before that he was a slave. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was almost murdered. Throughout this whole thing, there's this beautiful tapestry of God's plan. We're going to see how this happens. The famine struck. So the, the dreams of Pharaoh, for those who, those who may not know, he had a dream that was interpreted by Joseph as meaning that there would be seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine that would be so bad it would make the seven years of abundance look like nothing and everyone will forget it. And he said that his plan that he pitched to Pharaoh was that we have to use the seven good years and save up a fifth of all the produce and put it in barns in every city, and then we'll sell it to people in the famine. Now the famine has struck, and it's so bad they forgot the seven good years, and the surrounding nations were also struck by famine, including Joseph's family. Why did I read his dream in the beginning to you? His dream happened when he was 17. He is now 30. He's been a slave and a prisoner For 13 years. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Now, Jacob hears that there's grain in Egypt. Jacob, his father. And he sends 10 sons to go, but he keeps Benjamin behind, the youngest. Because he's still mourning the one he lost, and he's afraid he's going to lose this one as well. Joseph now was governor, and he was actually selling all the grain himself. He was the one everyone had to come to and buy from. So he was working hard. He recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. It seems that he then tests them. Maybe partly, you know, he was trying to get back at them. (laughs) But I think he was mainly testing whether their hearts have changed towards his brother, the younger brother, Benjamin. He wanted to see would they still betray one of their brothers. And you can read all about it in the Bible. This is not the point of today. But it's a fascinating account of what happens there. And right throughout, you see Joseph, a few times, Joseph is dealing with his brothers as a harsh, you know, leader in his office. And then it says he stepped away and wept because he was overwhelmed, seeing his brothers, yearning to connect with them. But he, he first wanted to test them. And he has this resolve to get that happening. And after sending them home, so they come the first time, he sends them home with grain, and he puts the money they paid back on top in the bag, which totally freaks them out, (laughs) makes them go, oh, they're going to kill us. And he says, only come back if you have Benjamin with you. Jacob doesn't want to let go of Benjamin because he's very sad. He 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 says, if I lose this son, I will die. And then they come back with Benjamin. Jacob finally lets him go. They come back. Now again, Joseph gets emotional when he meets Benjamin because they share the same mother. And they are eating and having a great time. And then he sends them off with more grain and he puts all the money back in their bags. And in Benjamin's bag, he puts one of his royal cups. And he sends his God after them. The God catches up with them, says, how could you do this evil thing in the sight of the Lord, meaning Joseph? And they said, what do you mean? They said, whoever has the cup will become a slave of Joseph. And so they all went back when they found the cup in Benjamin's bag, wanting to chat to Joseph. So they're all standing there now. And now this is the moment of where he's testing his brothers. And I want to go into that, but I'm not going to. Bottom line, he, he sees that Judah, the one who instigated his sale, is now the guy fighting for Benjamin. And just in that moment, he sees that Judah has changed. Because Judah is willing to step into the place of Benjamin. And he, did, he breaks down. The Bible says he breaks down. He chases out all the Egyptians. And he starts weeping with his brothers. He says, I am Joseph, your brother. Listen to this. Genesis 45. And Joseph said to his brother, please come near to me. So they came near. And he said to them, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, but now. Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve your life. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not with you It was not you who sent me here. 
It is not you who sold me into slavery. It is not you who caused that I landed up in a prison. But God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. What? A father to Pharaoh. A 30-year-old snotkopi is the father of Pharaoh. Hello? And lord of all his house and ruler throughout the land of Egypt. And he sends them to fetch his father. Pharaoh finds out that his brothers have come. Now, Pharaoh doesn't get angry. He gets excited. There's so much favor on Joseph's life that Pharaoh gives favor to his whole family. He says, let them leave everything they have. We're going to give them everything better here. Just bring them. Here's the best oxen, the best carriages, everything. Just go fetch them and bring them back. Amazing. Genesis 45. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to them, the spirit of Jacob, uh, listen to this. Now, this is them coming back to fetch Jacob, and they're hearing, he's hearing the whole story for the first time. He's hearing for the first time that Joseph is alive. Listen to this. The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. The next sentence, then Israel said. (laughs) Jacob's spirit was revived. What did God call Jacob after their encounter? I did a sermon on this months ago. He changed his name to Israel. What is the people of God called still today? The Israelites. When he was, he was Jacob, when he was mourning, and when he was dysfunctionally loving his, another young son, then his spirit was revived by the good news. And now he's Israel. <laughs> and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. As Israel was on his way to Egypt, God speaks to him in a vision in the night to confirm that going to Egypt at this time is God's plan. God speaks to the Father and confirms that this is all part of His will. How beautiful. And that He will bring them out again. He promises what Moses is going to do 400 years later. He's promising to Jacob, to Israel. Because of Joseph's favor and his knowledge of Egyptian culture, he was able to secure the best area and the best land for his family with their livestock in the land of Goshen. Joseph had amazing wisdom from God, and his position of authority gave him so much power and influence in the whole nation of Egypt in a time of famine and lack. Joseph was so positioned to buy all of the land and the people of Egypt for Pharaoh. Because people kept buying grain, then they ran out of money, then they sold livestock for grain, then they ran out of livestock, then they said, buy us. So, He ended up, with all his authority, literally buying the whole of Egypt for Pharaoh. With the people included. And the people of God in Goshen multiplied exceedingly and had possessions. Jacob blesses his sons, gives a great blessing to Joseph, and gives him a double portion of above his brothers. Shortly thereafter, Jacob dies. Joseph gets permission to go and bury him with his fathers, and the brothers are worried. Now, after Joseph buries Israel, the brothers are worried. What is he going to do now? Because daddy is not here anymore. (laughs) Listen to this. This is beautiful. He's already told them, don't be afraid. I'm not angry. This is the perspective I have of what God is doing. I'm not stuck in what you did to me. Did you hear that? I'm not focusing on the wounds you caused me. I'm not focusing on the hurt that you caused me. I'm not focusing on the 12 years in prison. I'm focusing on God's plan. Listen to this in Genesis 50. So they sent messages to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brother and their sin. For they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept. When they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we are your servants. What is this? The dream. The first dream was them falling before him to buy grain. Now they're falling before him a second time. 
He had two dreams. <laughs> Do not be afraid. For I am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day, to save my, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I just realized something. They were now living in a land where all the people were slaves to Pharaoh, but they were free. Oh, this huge. Oh. These are the words of someone who went through some really tough times. All of us sit here today and think, I have problems. You've got a list of problems, a list of things you're struggling with, Okay. How many of you have been sold to slavery by your family? For 20 pieces of silver, this is what you're worth. Maybe that hasn't happened to you, but maybe you feel abandoned by your family. A father, a mother, brothers and sisters. Maybe you feel imprisoned, not physically, but emotionally, spiritually. Spiritually. There's stuff in my life that makes me feel I'm in chains. I, I can't get free. Joseph had every reason to be bitter, hateful, and feel like a victim and act accordingly. Yet, he stayed the course. He stayed close to God. He stayed obedient and always in the fear of the Lord. And he could see that what happened to him was within God's plan to save his people. Do you think Joseph was able to see, would have been able to see God's plan if he was fixating on his, on his situation? What happens with wounds? It blinds us to what God is doing. If we keep looking at life through my past, my hurt, my issues, my baggage, my weaknesses, we miss what God is being, is up to. We miss it. Do you want to be someone who fixates on your problems, who, who gets stuck with your baggage? Or do you want to be someone who attends to your baggage and moves on into the plan that God has for you? Do you want to be someone who recognizes that the baggage is actually part of his plan? We don't want to hear that, but that's what it is. Joseph realizes it. He says, you didn't send me to Egypt. God did. It's in the Bible. It's there. It's written. Joseph has this revelation. You think you did this to me. <laughs> no, no, no. God allowed it to happen for his plans and his purposes. I want you to take whatever the worst problem in your life is right now. And I want you to put this in front of you. And I want you to see this the way Joseph sees it. Prison and slavery did not define me. Being falsely accused did not define me. God defines me. And his plan for my life is bigger than me. It's for all my people. There's a plan for your life that's bigger than you. It could be your family. It could be your school. It could be your business. It could be the people you influence online. What are you doing for God's kingdom in those people's lives? And to what extent are you being held back to walk in the fullness of it because you're stuck on wounds and hurts that you haven't attended to? It's time to get free. It's time to walk in the fullness that God has for us. Come on. We all need to take a life-changing note from the life of Joseph. Remember, this is Old Testament, Old Covenant. Jesus had not yet died in this timeline. Joseph was walking in relationship with God based on what his father had taught him and on his own time spending with God. And early on as a 17-year-old, he knew that God gave him dreams and that he could interpret dreams. He realized that he had a gift, but that gift and its use was given and empowered by God. He knew this. And therefore, its purpose was ultimately for God's purposes. And yes, maybe as a 17-year-old, I've heard people preach on this and say he was, he was cocky and he was arrogant in the way that he... But you don't, that's not written there. You can read the way he told the dreams in different tones and get different meanings. Yes. But he wasn't necessarily cocky about it. I mean, you can tell people in any tone, 
I saw a dream where you bow down to me. And they're not going to like it. Right? He was telling the truth. And the truth upset people. That happens. All the time. What I'm preaching today is going to upset some people. I'll probably get an email again. I got one last week. So when... (laughs) That's funny. All right. So when the worst of circumstances happened to him, he could weather the storms because he knew God was with him and have favor on him and made him prosperous. We read this a few times in the story. God was with him. God gave him favor and God made him prosperous. And his prosperity always benefited those around him. No one's listening to me right now because my little girl is here. Hello, you're beautiful thing. All right, I need to say that again because you're all like, oh, (laughs) blah, 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 blah. Listen, this is important. When the worst of circumstances happened to him, he could weather the storms because he was in relationship with God. His relationship with God was so strong, and it was pre-Jesus. That's important to note. God gave him favor because he was with him and made him prosperous. And his prosperity, Joseph's prosperity, always benefited those around him. The flavor of God is on his life and it affects everything around him. So now, to come back to our focus today, leave your luggage attended. You and I have luggage. We have bad experiences. Circumstances have happened to us. We have wounds from things that we had no control over. And we have wounds from consequences from things we did ourselves. Plus, we may carry resentment toward God for thinking He allowed certain things to happen to us, and we blame Him for letting it happen. It's your fault, God, that I got hurt as a child. It's your fault, God, that I didn't have a dad. It's your fault, God, blah, blah, blah. And we get stuck on that. What is Joseph teaching us today? It was God's plan all along to benefit His people. Now, your first reaction to that could be, yeah, but what about me? You died. When you gave your life to Christ. And when I say that you need to do what God wants, and if it hurts you and it's His plan, just go with it and go through it, and that offends you to the extent that you're offended right now, that's the extent to which you have not died. And that's okay. That's normal. We are all busy part on this road of sanctification but don't get offended get convicted and make right i'm telling you the truth for your benefit so our view of life of love of marriage parenting and relationships can be distorted by these things if we don't get rid of them if we don't attend to them We need to clean the glasses by identifying the hurt which opened us up to a lie from the enemy and caused us to create a neutral pathway, a neural pathway rut, so to speak, and a way of thinking about ourselves, about God and others. And this includes how we think about our spouse. The way we think of ourselves will affect the way we think of our spouse. So if I think I'm a victim, if I think everyone's out to get me, if I got hurt as a child, and I I want, every time it seems like I'm going to get hurt again, I I burst out in anger because I never want to feel like that again. What am I doing? I'm projecting all of that stuff onto the one that should be the closest to me. I want to say to us today, together as a family in Jesus, no more. We can take action today. We can repent, and which, what is repentance? We did a whole sermon on this, two actually. It's changing the way you think. How are you thinking? It's possible to change it in Jesus. Turn to God, embrace the truth that He speaks over us and the plan He has for us. Like Joseph, God has a plan with each of our lives. He has it. Your plan will not look like Joseph's plan because He has a plan for you and it's unique. But we can take a lesson from Joseph's life and not let our baggage get in the path of us fulfilling that plan. 
And we must know, if I am born again, I keep saying this, why? Because some of you haven't realized that you haven't died to the full extent that you need to die in Christ so that Christ can fully come alive in us, fully have the mind of Christ. Amen? And I'm not saying this because I'm, I've got it all down pat and I live it every day completely. I'm preaching this because it's the Word of God and God has told me to preach it. We are all on this journey. Amen? The way to the fulfillment of, what, of that plan may look and feel like it's difficult and filled with suffering. Because we have also adopted the, way, the world's way of thinking that we, our ultimate goal in life is to be happy. Right? The world keeps telling us, you deserve to be happy. Buy this product and you will be. <laughs> Your happiness is everything. As long as you're happy. I just want you to be happy. We hear that all the time. What does happiness mean? Normally, it means that you are comfortable, you have a convenient life, you have more than enough, and nothing ever goes wrong. Would you agree? That's not life. The more you think you're going to be, you can get to that place where nothing goes wrong, the more things may go wrong. And when things do go wrong, you go like, oh, I'm not happy. Oh, I'm not this. Oh, I'm not that. Because I had an expectation of something that is not God's plan. Whew, I need to land this plan. And Paul writes in Romans, sorry, so we need to remember, and I've preached on this a few times, but like James says in James 1, we need to count it all joy when trials of various kinds come our way. Why? Because we grow in character and we get to the place where we are perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Who wants to be perfect, complete, lacking nothing? Who wants to be in a marriage where it's perfect, complete, lacking nothing? Okay, count it all joy when trials come. Boom. And if the trial is derailing you and making it hard for you to do what God has called you to do, it's a sign that you have not died. Romans 5 says, we need to glory in tribulation. <laughs> I won't get into that. I did a whole sermon on that. Be because this all builds character and perseverance and makes us perfect, complete, lacking nothing, and it gives us a hope that doesn't disappoint. That's what the Bible promises. On the other side of suffering, on the other side of tough times, there is hope in Jesus. Jesus himself says in uh, Matthew 13 or 16, he says, in this life, you will have trouble. <laughs> but take heart, for in me you will have peace. For I've overcome the world. That is our hope. That whatever we are going through, God is bigger. Jesus has been there. He has died for that. He has set us free from it. And if we aren't living in the fullness of that, it just means we need to spend more time with Him. It needs, means we need to maybe go for some counseling. Recognize the wounds. Recognize the hurt. And attend to it. God can heal anything. That's what he does. All right. We're going to reflect and respond on this. It took me a long time to get to this point, but I, I hope you see why. It's because this is so, 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 so important. And I hope that if anything, what landed with you today is that God has a plan for your life. God is with you in the process. That we need to make sure of our repentance, salvation, faith, Lordship, all the stuff we did already. We have to make sure that this is in place. And then we need to attend to our luggage so that we can walk into marriage, walk into parenting, walk into business, walk into the plan God has for us without that stuff blinding us and without that stuff holding us back. Amen? Who wants to live like that? I want to live like that. So let's close our eyes and let's focus on Jesus. You may feel like certain wounds from your past are weighing you down, like chains are holding you back. You may feel stuck, not free. Today, the Holy Spirit can set your mind and heart free by the power of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that that is possible? If you do, please embrace that and apply it. Bring your luggage, your baggage, your issues, your hurt, your shame, your guilt, your addictions. Bring it before God this morning. See yourself laying it down before the throne of God. He did everything He needed to do on the cross. It is done. It is finished. 
It is done. It is finished. He wants you to be in a healthy marriage. He wants you to be a great parent. And some of the stuff you went through was part of His plan to make you a great husband, a great wife, a great mom, a great dad, so that you can affect the lives of others for His kingdom. Let's start seeing the wounds for what they are and ask the Holy Spirit right now to bring the healing. Lord Jesus, with everyone here and with everyone online and those listening, I just bring everyone's stuff before you. All these things that blind us, that hurt, that keep hurting us, that keep the devil lying to us. We just come and we lay it all at your feet right now. And we ask that you bring healing to our hearts, clarity to our minds, and wholeness to our spirits. We pray that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to the Love Key Church podcast message of the week. I trust that you had a life-changing encounter with God that will help you to align with His purposes so that you can be one step closer to reigning in life. And may you be inspired to share this with others. Have a great week and remember to listen again next week or you can catch us live online or come visit us in person. May God bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you and your loved ones. God bless you. Bye-bye.